Today, we welcome Dr. Robert Gagnon, who is the Professor of New Testament Theology at Houston Baptist University School of Christian Thought. Dr. Gagnon previously taught at Pittsburgh Theological Seminary for 23 years. He has degrees from Dartmouth, Harvard, and Princeton Theological Seminary. And his main fields of interest are Pauline theology and sexual issues in the Bible. He's the author of the book, The Bible and Homosexual Practice, Text and Hermeneutics, and co-author of Homosexuality in the Bible, Two Views. In addition, he's published articles, encyclopedia entries, and has written and been quoted in numerous publications. Dr. Gagnon, welcome today to think about it. Thank you for having me, Jerry. And uh, so 23 years in Pittsburgh and then the transition here to Houston. Yes, it's, uh, it's been an interesting transition, both theologically and in terms of climate. Um, theologically, it's, uh, I just, I love it. <laughs> at Houston Baptist University. It's Christ-centered. Um, I feel like when I'm praying with people, we're praying to the same God, not just an ideological cipher that doesn't have the same meaning. And uh, just the faculty is so, in School of Christian Thought, and also faculty I've met in, in philosophy and apologetics, they are just love the Lord, very highly qualified, great publications, great conversationalists, sense of humor. I love to have a sense of humor in people. Uh, it's just been, I'm telling you, I mean, it, it's, it's, I know it's not Shangri-La or Utopia, but it is about as close as I have experienced to that. It's been a great and wonderful time being there. Climate, I've, um, you know, the summer is a little hot, but, uh, but <laughs> just a tad, but the winter, fabulous. I just, I just love it. It's like, you know, skipping basically in the Northeast. It's, it's skipping from mid-October to April or mid-April. Yeah. And I love to skip those months now. Right. So that's just all wonderful. Well, we welcome you to HBU. And um, tell us about the degrees that you um, accumulated from Dartmouth and Harvard and Princeton. So I was a uh, history major at Dartmouth College, uh, mostly focused on American history. I ended up doing a an honors thesis for the history department, not the religion department, on form criticism and the historical Jesus, which was quite a learning experience. I uh, gave myself time, took an extra year, and um, and I'm so glad I did. It prepared me for going to Harvard Divinity School. Subsequently, a lot of people who go into an institution like that are into very quickly a pressure chamber and they wind up changing their views on some critical issues and having a low view of scripture, low Christology, et cetera, coming out of that experience. Doing that extra time in, for the honors thesis at Dartmouth really gave me a chance to look at critical issues, but arrive at faithful positions without being under extraordinary pressure to change my mind about things. Obviously, I changed my mind about things where I thought, you know, weren't essentials of the faith. Uh, but still um, ended up with a very solid, Christ-centered, high view of Scripture. Went to Harvard Divinity School with that. Started a group, Harvard Divinity Students Fellowship there. Uh, they thought it was a, a spy organization, you know, because we were an evangelical group there. We just had a wonderful time. Fellowship with this, you know, it's a relatively small number of students there, uh, encouraging one another who were evangelical, Christ-centered in their viewpoint and uh, then went off to Princeton Theological Seminary, which actually really wasn't that different in terms of the theology from Harvard Divinity School in some ways. Students were more conservative, but the faculty were still, you know, at all types there. So oh. what that gave me is an opportunity to experience um, life in an environment where a lot of people didn't share my point of view theologically, Christologically, but it also prepared me for the roadmap that God would eventually take me toward. And you're teaching for 23 years at Pittsburgh Theological Seminary. Tell us about that. Well, <laughs> I can only tell you a few things. I'm somewhat uh, limited into what I can say, but um, let's just say that my viewpoint wasn't the most widely represented viewpoint there. So that was an interesting experience, uh, both among the faculty and students. 
So there was a, a, a time where that was okay. And then there was a time where I had to move on from that. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes you find, and I'm not saying this now, I'm, now I'm speaking more generally, that those who call themselves liberal are not necessarily so liberal, tolerant, diverse, pluralistic. Um, I find that the greatest amount of tolerance and pluralism and true diversity, uh, I really get at a place like HBU uh -huh. uh, in many respects. It's very ethnically diverse. Um, people are appropriately diverse within a Christ-centered perspective. So uh, it's, and actually are, are far more tolerant, I think, to a lot of views left of center theologically, to at least hear the arguments uh, and to deal with them. So I'm, I think it's, we're moving into a time period now where it's the, it's the Christ-centered persons who are the most uh, tolerant, diverse, and pluralistic. You know, it's interesting right now in uh, Hong Kong, we see the move of Xi Jinping and the, the People's Republic of China that has violated what, what is the accepted, um, you know, what the, their, the treaty that they signed and um, they're taking over Hong Kong. And I, I noticed with interest that one of the things they're taking over is obviously the internet, much as it is in mainland China. And they're censoring, beginning their censorship campaign uh, with different media or social media platforms that are trying to figure out how they're gonna respond, et cetera. And we look at that in Hong Kong and we look what the Chinese are doing under Xi Jinping who sees himself somewhat as a contemporary Mao Zedong. And we say, you know, that is just such a overreach of, of anything, you know, that of freedom. But here in America, we have almost a very similar thing going on that most people are not aware of. And that if there are certain issues or certain topics that you and I talk about, and we post them later today on a social media platform, there are censors now. And if they do not agree with even what we talk about, then they will not allow it either to be on the platform, let alone it to be what we call boosted, where we're paying an amount of money to get more circulation on the platform. And uh, most American Christians don't even know this is going on. It's already begun. And so tech, is driving the cultural revolution in the United States of America. And we can see that in many examples. We see it in the unempirical findings of, of the trans movement today that is being established almost as empirical fact when, when there's so much we don't know. And I'm borrowing now from Douglas Murray's book, The Madness of the Crowds, where he's a London journalist who has said, numerous instances medically in, in the UK. Um, why are we in an age where the tolerant are so intolerant? Well, I think we're seeing that the so-called liberal enterprise, which is really a left-wing enterprise, both politically and theologically, although they have created for a long period of time a view of themselves that one that is that tolerant culture, be more tolerant, right? That's what we're always hearing. But now we're seeing what they really meant by that, tolerance only for their position. And once their position gains the ascendancy, then our voices are no longer to be tolerated. Now I've published extensively on the issue you noted of the, of the Bible and homosexual practice, the Bible's position towards a male female requirement for sexual ethics which Jesus regarded as absolutely foundational for all sexual ethics. And for the longest time in mainline denominations, I spoke mostly, mostly in mainline denominations, not in conservative evangelical circles, uh, at points in time in which those mainline denominations actually still held an orthodox position. And they kept saying, you know, we just want to hear all the voices. And what they were doing was undermining the resistance to what scripture and its unanimous view would regard as high immorality. And the moment they gained ascendancy in those denominational structures, 
there were no more dialogues to be had about the issue. I never got invitations again. So they never were about hearing all the voices. They were only about hearing their voices and then canceling all voices that disagree with them. And unfortunately, we're reaching a point in time now where things which used to be taken for granted. I mean, even, even imagine Obama ran for president opposing gay marriage. Well, we all knew he was lying at the time, but even so, that, that's how he ran for the president. And uh, now to say that you can get canceled and removed from social media, uh, to say that a man who thinks that he's a woman still is biologically a man and shouldn't have access to female restrooms and dressing rooms and sports and locker rooms and prisons and shelters. Now that is regarded as hate speech. I mean, it's just extraordinary. You can say the most obvious things um, that counter the fake science that is out there that uh, you really can't do. You really can't change your sex. You can only make a cosmetic adjustment. Uh, and yet that now is to be regarded as hate speech. It's just extraordinary. I mean, it's scientifically accurate in addition to being accurate from a biblical standpoint, but yet to say it is hate. And the real problem here is even in the church we're seeing this. So essentially positions that Jesus would have held are being regarded as positions of hate. Well, let me ask you this. From a mainline denomination standpoint, you obviously were engaged in the mainline denominations, apparently, for a number of years. What mainline denomination were you involved in, and what did you observe over that two-and-a-half-decade period? Well, I was uh, PC, PCUSA, Presbyterian, Presbyterian Church, United States of America, um, and but also spoke not only at Presbyterian venues, but also at Evangelical Lutheran Church of America venues, the Episcopal Church. Um, Methodist Church, so really all across the board, even UCC churches for some period of time. And what's interesting is that when I would speak there, they would all say, if especially if I was coming to a non-Presbyterian venue, uh, they would say, "Well, you're you're just you don't understand the ethos of our denomination." But in the end, whether I was debating with Lutherans, UCC, uh, Episcopalians, Methodists, or Presbyterians. On the other side, they all sounded alike. They all made the exact same arguments, undermining the witness of Scripture, actually trying to ignore the witness of Scripture, using these terrible hermeneutical arguments, temp attempting to move from then to now, but not paying attention to what the text said in, in its own context, arguing things like, well, they didn't know about committed same-sex relationships, or they didn't know about... Uh, biological factors keying into orientation and so forth. Uh, and yet I could show from the ancient world that those things were already being considered, at least at some sort of rudimentary level. They knew quite a lot of committed same-sex relationships, even same-sex marriages, semi-official marriages taking place in Alexandria, uh, Egypt, and in Rome, uh, and in Antioch. And when I would point these things out to them, like it didn't make any difference. Okay, we'll try some other argument. In other words, they never really cared what Scripture had to say, or even what Jesus' viewpoint was on the issue. One guy debated the academic dean at Yale Divinity School. Uh, after he made his case for a half hour, and then I made my case, he got up and he said, well, okay, it really wasn't about Scripture for me after all. Even though he had spent his entire half hour trying to make the case from Scripture, when I showed it to be incorrect, it's like, well, it didn't really matter for me. That's not the reason. I hold the position I do. And that's where we are in the church today in the mainline denominations. There are many of them that are now arguing, okay, we even agree that Jesus would have opposed our position. I actually debated a, a professor of New Testament at Fuller Seminary who started his position by saying, Dr. Gagnon is going to tell you that Jesus wouldn't have accepted even a committed same-sex relationship. And I said, I agree, that's probably historically true. But Jesus had insufficient knowledge to make that determination. Mm. Extraordinary. I thought, I've already won the debate. I haven't even got up to speak yet. And I hammered that home repeatedly. Not only did Jesus have this viewpoint, but he arrived at this viewpoint 
in within a culture that was opposed to the larger culture prevailing in the ancient Near East and in the Greco-Roman Mediterranean basin, and yet held that position and not only held it, but applied it consistently to what it would mean for numbers of same sex, numbers of partners that you would have in a sexual union, polyamory, polygamy in his own cultural context. And on the basis of a male female requirement, he said, no polygamy allowed anymore because there is an essential dynamic of two-ness, male and female, the two halves of a sexual spectrum integrating to form a single sexual whole. So for Jesus, it was bedrock. It was foundational for everything, not just a side issue, not just him naively imbibing at the cultural well. Well, then my big partner didn't like me to say that because he wanted to make the case, well, it's not a big deal for Jesus. He was wrong, but not a big deal. And what I was arguing is not only did Jesus hold this view, but for him, it was foundational for his understanding of all sexual ethics. All his understanding of sexual norms derives from that one at the foundation. But it's, that's the point they're getting to now, to say, well, even, if, and another guy I spoke with, William Loder, who's written more on sexual ethics in early Judaism and early Christianity than any other scholar in the world. I've done more on homosexuality, but he's done more on sexual ethics generally. New Testament professor from Australia, uh, active in supporting gay marriage and his cultural context. And yet he and I agree in almost everything about what the scripture actually says and about what Jesus believed. He just says, well, I just disagree with Jesus. And I'm thinking if that's the hill you want to die on, so be it. <laughs> but now there are people acknowledging that because the argument is so uh, powerful for that case. And yet to say that even if our Lord Jesus Christ thought this was essential, we're just going to disagree with him. That's the state of the church today. Well, we also, uh, IROD, the Institute of Religion and Democracy in Washington, D.C., Mark Tooley, the ex-CIA agent who monitors mainline denominations, has pointed out that mainline denominations have gone from 50 million to less than 20 million. And they're in dissent from that point. Um, the United Methodist Church is the current one that's getting ready to erupt in a fissure. And as we know, it's over this particular topic. And what has been the resistance factor has been a huge number of United Methodists that are in Africa who are conservative. And uh, so now a political move is being made to to, to bifurcate those two parts and somehow move forward. I mean, what, wh why, why do denominational leaders, uh, because I, I don't know of hardly anyone that is like they were 20 years ago that I was, um, you know, as in, em emphatic about their denomination as they, they were as a kid, you know, grandma who gave the stained glass window is certainly becoming a relic of the past. Why do these denominational leaders not reconcile the dissent numerically, spiritually, of their denomination and their theological position? Well, it's, it's the one word denial, and we're not talking about a river in Egypt, right? This is, there. You would think, even as they're using rhetoric, where they're claiming they're the ones that are able to reach out to a wider number of people, they are diminishing in a virtual freefall in terms of their numbers. And then they explain that as well, now we're getting a leaner, uh, more uh, dynamic body of Christ that's all for the good. But actually, people are leaving in droves because if you're not going to listen to your own Lord, the one who rescued you from your sin and rose from the dead for a new creation, humanity, if you're not going to listen to this one, what is the point of us going to church? No point whatsoever. Let's find some other philosophy that we can go with. But obviously, you're not taking this one seriously. And it's, it's reached a point, Jerry, where it's not only sexual ethics that is being questioned. I've had to fight within the mainline denominations, even something as essential as the atonement, where it came to a point in certain contexts, which I can't mention, that by proclaiming that 
Paul believed, and the entire early church believed, that Jesus died to make amends or restitution for human sin, and that only he has done that. Only he has uh, redeemed us from our sin and atoned our wrongdoing. That to say that makes even seminary students feel unsafe. Hmm. And it can be claimed that a professor who teaches that bedrock understanding of the Christian faith is not adequately preparing students for ministry because they're not giving equal credence to the view that Paul and the rest of early Christianity did not believe that Jesus died to make amends for human sin. It's absolutely extraordinary. I mean, I can read a text like 1 Corinthians 15, where Paul says to the Corinthians, now I handed on the gospel to you, by which you're being saved, if you hold firmly to it, otherwise you believed in vain, that Christ died for our sins and was raised on the third day from the dead. And Paul is quite clear when he makes that statement. He says, whether you, whether you align yourself with Peter in Jerusalem or Apollo in Alexandria or any other part of the church, we all agree that this is bedrock. And now in many venues of the Christian faith and mainline denominations, to claim that that's an irreducible minimum of the Christian faith is to make seminary students feel unsafe and not adequately prepare them for ministry. This is why where the church is currently in the shape it's in. And an institution like HBU is saying, no, 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 no. That is, the church is being harmed by that kind of rhetoric, by dismissing what is central to the Christian faith and to the core gospel. And the beauty of an institution like HBU is to say, you know what? We're not going to dilute the gospel simply because of the larger cultural pressures and the cancel culture that we're now in, we're not going to change the message of, of the gospel to suit people who want to undermine that message. No matter what the persecution, no matter what the outcome, we're going to proclaim it, because as Peter says to Jesus in John 6, who else has the words of eternal life? You know, where else are we going to go? When Jesus is saying, eat my flesh, drink my blood, as a metaphor for saying, you can't do an end run around me. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father except through me. And if you think, if this is offensive to you, and it is offensive to people, that kind of claim where Jesus is saying, I am the truth, I am the way or road, I am the life, there's nobody but me, you have to go through me. He's saying that to an audience steeped in Moses. How could anyone else, if, you, if Moses isn't adequate, how could the Buddha or Muhammad be adequate? There's nobody else that could be. But, you know, where else are we going to go? Jesus is the only way. And the beauty of a place like HBU is they're willing to stand on that message no matter what the outcome. That's why I love it. That's why it's a great place to be. That's why I regularly, metaphorically kiss the ground to be there because, I mean, it's... I just can't believe when I'm teaching and proclaiming the gospel that I'm not actually going to get turned into the dean for doing so. It's not a negative. Wonderful. Wonderful place. Well, and I mean, I was going to say the transition of you at the School of Christian Thought at HBU uh, must be a, a stark difference compared to the environments that you've been in for a number of years. I'll just say just in general, to be in the, um, a mainline context, I did not experience it as a liberating moment in which I could share my understanding of Scripture and those on the left could share their understanding and then we could have an engaged discussion. That wasn't my experience. My experience is Gagnon is a threat. And why is he a threat? He won't shut up. He won't say that his position is no better than anybody else's position. Well, it's not my position. That's why I can't say it. I can't say that the position that God has created us male and female, a complementary sexual pair, and that sexual ethics is based on that foundation, I can't say that that's, that's a position that's no better or worse than any other position in terms of a view of what Scripture says. I, I can't say that the position that Paul did not believe that Jesus died to make amends for your sin, or that Jesus rose from the dead to inaugurate a new creation, I can't say that that position is only one 
Christian position no better than any other Christian position. That is the position of Scripture. There is no other position. And if anybody else wants to have a different point of view, make your case. That's okay. I'm not going to persecute you. Make your case. Show me from Scripture where your argument can be defended. But what you see happening in mainline denominations is they don't want a fair fight. They don't want a dialogue even. They don't want people presenting their best case. They want you saying that this position, which is the historic position of the church, is just one of many positions that an individual could hold. Well, there isn't any early Christian that thought that way. The reason why Paul went around the Mediterranean basin, risking his life on a daily basis in synagogues before secular authorities, being beaten by whipped in the synagogues, 40 lashes minus one, being beaten by rods by secular authorities in constant anxiety for his churches, poorly clad, poorly sheltered, poorly fed. Why did Paul go through a life like that? It wasn't to say, hey, I'm okay, you're okay, whatever you believe is fine. Paul said, no, I have come to a point in my life where I regarded all my attainments in Judaism as Greek word skubala, which means basically crap, excrement and rubbish at the same time in comparison to knowing Jesus. That's the life-saving message that we have to the church. And Paul's repeatedly saying, I'm not some common huckster. I don't dilute my, my wares, my, my, the, the, the message of the gospel that I give. I don't deliver shoddy goods. I give you the industrial strength version of the gospel. This is it. This is the message and the only message by which we're saved. And this is why I'm not ashamed of that gospel. That's the example I want to look at, or the example of Jesus willing to go to the cross to proclaim the message of who he is and what he has done for humanity, even before the high priest declaring in full view of everybody exactly who he is, knowing that he would be crucified for saying it. That's what we need more of in the church. We need boldness of speech. We need courage by virtue of the fact that our you know, we're already in the, in the kingdom of God, experiencing a foretaste of that through the Spirit. We have an eternity with God ahead of us. This life and whatever suffering we experience is only slight or momentary compared to the overwhelming glory that stands in front of us. So let's share that message as free people, as free citizens of the kingdom of God, not fearing human beings more than we fear God, who can send not just body, but body and soul to hell. Let's, let's respond to the one who gave all in such great magnitude of grace and love, right? That's what HBU stands for. That's why I'm proud to be at an institution like HBU, because I don't have to add persecution from the institution to the persecution I'm getting from the world for sharing the gospel. Instead, I'm being encouraged to do that. That's why it's a great place for students to come. They'll get first-rate teaching, and they'll get people unashamed of the gospel. Well said, Dr. Robert Gagnon, who's the professor of New Testament theology in the School of Christian Thought at HBU. And we want you to check out HBU School of Christian Thought, hbu.edu slash school of Christian thought or SCT. Uh, Dr. Gagnon, do you teach both on the undergraduate and graduate level at HBU? I do, and I enjoy both groups equally. It's been a great experience. And when you encounter an undergraduate student in one of your classes at HBU, how versed are they in sexual ethics as, the, as it relates to Scripture? A lot of people know the correct position they should arrive at, but don't know how to get there and don't know the arguments, and don't know, know how to respond to the arguments on the, on the other side. And that's true for almost for many of the Christian issues. Um, and as you know, at HBU, we don't just have Christian students. We have Christians, well, Christians of all theological variety and people who even are not Christian. So it's also partly a mission field as well. And that's great. That's a great opportunity. I, didn't, I went to schools like Dartmouth and Harvard where people did not, were not generally evangelical in their viewpoint, Wonderful. I had many of the same questions. I didn't start as a Christian. I didn't grow up in a Christian household. Uh, I grew up in a nominal Christian household. Let's put it that way. But I didn't accept Christ until I was just about ready to head towards college. So I know what that's like. I had those kinds of questions. I still wrestle with questions today. So let's 
bring those out to the surface and let's have a conversation about them. And I have no fear of that because I do see the gospel and Jesus Christ as the ultimate yes to all God's promises in our life. So it's a wonderful time. Well, I totally agree. Dr. Gragnan, thank you so much for joining us today on Think About It. And we want to encourage everyone to realize that HBU School of Christian Thought is available, not only residentially, it's available online, HBU online. Check out all the different academic offerings, uh, so many ways to enrich yourself biblically. Trusted Bible scholars who know their stuff and also love Jesus Christ and are not, not a, a apologizing for the truth of the gospel. Um, that's the difference they make. And Dr. Gagnon, we're grateful that you're here and we pray that you have a great year. Thank you, Jerry. It's been wonderful to have a conversation with you.